Good morning, everyone. So, uh, as one of the first three uh, GO team members next to Rob Park and Ken Thompson, I was invited to talk a little bit uh, about my views on the creation of GO and its progress so far and its future. This is naturally a more uh, personal talk, and I may see things differently or remember things differently, so keep this in mind. But uh, let's be clear up front Go wouldn't be possible without the rest of the Go team, and certainly not without the open source community. So it was a privilege and also an honor to be able to contribute from the very beginning. With that uh, disclaimer out of the way, let's get started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, evolution takes some strange turns sometimes. So uh, let me give you a little bit of personal background. Um, <coughs> I had an early interest in programming languages, um, and it really started when I saw the first report on the programming language Pascal. Uh, here, there was a description of a language that was concise, disciplined. There was actually a method behind the design. It was quite different from uh, the language manuals that I had read at that time, which was mostly basic uh, manuals and perhaps some, uh, you know, pocket calculator program and pocket cal calculator manuals. So this interest only deepened when I was able to study at ETH Zurich in Switzerland uh, under uh, Niklaus Wirt, who is actually the creator of Pascal and several successor languages. And they actually had a direct impact on Go, as I will try to point out a little bit more here. Uh, it's interesting, we had a talk, uh, the last talk yesterday, uh, went in the same direction. I'm trying to not have too much overlap here, and uh, there's a few corrections, perhaps. So at grad school, industry, uh, programming in industry, sorry, when I left grad school, <coughs> programming in industry felt quite a, like a huge step backward. Um, in, at the university, we had a system that was built there using a language that was built there, namely Oberon, and uh, it was extremely productive. And so when I started programming in industry, which was essentially C++ programming, I just didn't have the productivity anymore. So I really wanted to go back uh, to this productivity. And so as time went by over the years, I spent a lot of time thinking about programming languages and how to make them better. But actually, it is really hard to make a good programming language. In fact, it's so hard, it's, it's just a misnomer that we call this thing software. <laughs> so, but at some time, at some point, you know, after 15, years of programming in C++, there comes a day of reckoning. You have to figure out what to do with your life. Are you going to sell out or bail out? And so we decided, and I decided to bail out, and uh, that was not a hard choice. And I uh, feel extremely lucky to be on board with both Rob and Ken. So, the beginning um, of the Go project started pretty much as uh, result of the frustration with a long C++ build. And Rob Pike had uh, talked about this before. But what was important was that we had a very clear goal in mind. We needed a better language for the things that we do at Google. I also had a personal motivation. I wanted to have that clean and small and compiled and compact type check language that I had worked with many years back. And I wanted to get back into the fun of programming. Or in other words, what I really wanted is, I wanted Lego bricks with which, with which I could build stuff. And I mean by that the elementary Lego bricks, not like the more fancy Lego bricks. Uh, which can only be used for one thing, you know, like the, the cover, like the car or something. Um, those Lego bricks are actually not orthogonal anymore when it comes to the design of, you know, the Lego pieces. And by, the modern, by modern features, I mean things like modules or packages and things like closures. Keep in mind, C++ is only getting packages or modules about now. Uh, same is true for closures. And uh, the closures in Java are at best an approximation. Also, both these languages are incredibly complex. Uh, for instance, the latest C++ standard is about a thousand pages in, in description. So here's a little uh, anecdote from, a, uh, from Google. So, it's not uncommon that an engineer will take a problem with C++ 
and you know, she sends out an email to the wider uh, group to figure out what the hell's going on. And so over the course of the day, lots of people chime in and send their elaborate, detailed answers. All of them are different. Eventually, at the end of the day, the local C++ guru, the one that wrote the book about the subject, you know, answers conclusively in a two or three page email. <laughs> this is completely wrong. I mean, here it's obviously the programming language that's getting into, into the way of things, and you don't even have time to think about the actual uh, thing that you should be working on. So we had some pretty good ideas of how to, uh, uh, how to address these issues that we saw, and we had quite a bit of unpolished thoughts about the rest. And there were these, we were three people with quite a bit of experience, and we thought, you know, we know how to not do things. And then, of course, there's always the lure. It's going to be fun to design a new language, and it's going to be easy. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> So, we had a few guiding principles, and the first are probably simplicity, safety, by that I mean memory safety, uh, and readability, uh, readability are paramount. And I cannot repeat that, I cannot understate uh, that, so let me say it again. Simplicity, safety, and readability. But I would like to also uh, point out that by simplicity, the simplicity for language design doesn't necessarily mean that other things have to be as simple. Uh, and I, uh, I want to uh, refer to the talk by Catherine yesterday where she pointed a little bit in this direction. Um, just because the language is super simple doesn't mean that your final product has to strive for the exact same thing, because sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes the thing that you're building is not simple by design, by definition. So there's, there's, there's levels. So we're striving for orthogonality in design, and uh, the reason for that is pretty clear. Uh, if you have orthogonal features, then they don't interfere with each other, and they're more easily combined. And we wanted the language to be minimal, uh, in, in the way that there's only one, essentially one mechanism to write a particular, uh, one way to write a particular construct. Um, so that takes away a lot of decision making when you actually write your program. And there's a few exceptions in those. Uh, most notably uh, variable declarations and perhaps the if and switch statement where there's some overlap. These are mostly for programmatic reasons. So we wanted to make sure that the things that we wanted to write that were of interest were easy to write, but we didn't want to make everything necessarily possible. For instance, we didn't want to make, make it easily possible to write log-free algorithms. That's something that uh, is in the domain of you know, experts and most people never have to do that. So how do we get started? So it turns out there's not much good literature on uh, language design, but there's a few papers, and there's two papers in, uh, in particular, both are by Tony Hoare, they're a little bit dated, but they're still quite uh, uh, on target, and I recommend them to everybody who is interested to read more about the subject. The second one reads like a Woody Allen movie, and I promise you, it's just about as much fun, even though it doesn't talk about sex. <laughs> <coughs> so, Ken, Rob, and I got started initially with a brainstorming uh, session and a whiteboard just to scope out sort of the uh, rough ballpark where we wanted to go. I think it was a, a Friday afternoon, and there was a weekend ahead of us, and there was a lot of time to think. So at the end of Sunday, I had written down everything that I recalled from our brainstorming session and lots and lots and lots of stuff uh, that I thought about and that were my ideas, simply because I want to make sure that we are going into the right direction. <coughs> so here's, a, here's sort of a summary uh, of, actually it's not a summary, this is really the first paragraph. Uh, and then this mail is very long, it's like two, three, four pages long. I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, but it's interesting when we're looking back that many of the ideas uh, of this very first day made it into Go. Uh, from the obvious, such as you know, the leading keyword notation, uh, lots of syntactic cleanups, 
to uh, you know, expressions of, with only five levels of binary precedence, as opposed to the 14 in C++, uh, to explicitly sized types to avoid uh, problems when you port to different platforms. To the less obvious, such as packages and imports, uh, methods with explicit receiver types, sorry, receiver parameters, and interfaces, and concurrency. But many of the concepts were missing, uh, and even more of the ideas that I um, and we thought about didn't make it at all. However, we were off to a pretty good start. But this was not clear in the beginning, and obvious at that time. So the origins of things always get a little bit blurred over time. Uh, it's something that actually took a long time to conceive, evolve really, later is imagined as this singular invention. You should keep in mind at all times that most ideas come from previous ideas. And uh, I apologize to Alan Kay, he seems to be quite popular at this conference. <laughs> Actually, a lot of critics say there's nothing new in Go, but they're actually missing the point, because if you're designing a new language, you really should not invent, you should consolidate features that have established themselves for a long time. So consciously or not, a lot of the work we had done was exactly this. We would take existing features and mechanisms, distill them down, and maybe create a new syntax for them, uh, or adjust them as we need appropriate. And by having three people involved in the process, we made sure that nobody's uh, you know, favorite idea sort of got out of hand. So we had our own sort of checks and balances in place. It was not always pleasant, though, to get your favorite idea decimated or nothing. So where are most of these pre-existing ideas coming from? And it's really informative to look at the history of programming languages, and most notably, uh, we don't have to go all the way back here, but Algol 60 is really the starting point of everything. And uh, again, yesterday's last talk by VG already mentioned some of these collections. Um, he had to cover it necessarily from the outside, and trying to illuminate the background a little bit more uh, in detail. So Algol 60 was both a consolidation of what was learned before, mostly uh, from, uh, or most notably from Fortran and this. Uh, but it was also at the same time revolutionary in its forward-looking design. In fact, it was so forward-looking that Hor said, here is a language that's so far ahead of its time that it was not only an improvement on its predecessors, but also on nearly all its successors. And he probably meant Apple 68 at this point. So Algol 60 introduced the block structure, nested and recursive functions, procedures, type declarations, static typing, uh, you know, the, the usual keywords, semicolon separated statements, and so forth. There's a few fun facts about Algol. McCarthy actually suggested that they should uh, introduce recursive functions, and little did they know what they were in for, because that was a fairly new mechanism at that time. And it turns out that the keyword for actually comes from uh, much earlier, from 1952, from a uh, description actually for algorithms, which was called superplan, uh, the German word. And in that description, the uh, keyword was not for, but it was fuel, uh, the German word for for. Coincidentally, just two years before Algol 60, actually for Algol 58, Bacchus Nauer, who worked on Fortran, also uh, came out together with Peter Nauer uh, with the uh, Bacchus Nauer normal form, which is uh, now very much the standard uh, notation for syntax. Sometimes it's the extended Bacchus Nauer form as it go. It turns out that actually the Algol successors are really the ones that have direct impact on Go, namely Pascal and C. Pascal uh, is a successor of Algol uh, created by Niklaus Wirt. It shares many of the same features. It introduces semicolons as separators. It uses the all uppercase keywords, which uh, is now makes it really hard to read. 
I introduced left-to-right declarations, uh, principal type, uh, structured data types. It had even a notion of pre-declared functions, very much like we have in Go. Then on the other hand, on a different continent, C was developed, and it's actually quite similar to Pascal in many ways, structurally at least. Instead, except that there's currently braces for blocks, semicolons are not separate, uh, are not separators, they're terminators. And declarations are not left to right, instead they mimic queues. Uh, and there's, there's much better support for arrays and pointers, which is one of the things that was missing in Pascal and uh, really led to problems sometimes. I want to look a little bit more closely at some of the Pascal successors. So there's several of them. First of all, there is Modula and then eventually Modula 2. Modula 2 is important because it introduced the notion of separate compilation via uh, modules. And by separate, I mean separate, not independent. As you see, where you have you know, two files that you can compile independently, but there's not really much checking happening, except through, uh, you, you basically have to repeat declarations that you refer to from, uh, from the other file via an include. In Modula 2, you have an actual import statement. A few years later, Niklaus Weir worked on Oberon, which is a successor of Modula 2, and where he tried to distill the essentials of Modula 2 into a much smaller language. So in many ways, Oberon is uh, kind of a forerunner in this, uh, in this sort of approach to, to radical simplicity, to, concentration, to the concentration of the essential, at least for a statically typed language. Oberon introduced the concept of type extensions, which allowed uh, a basic form of object-oriented programming, but it was a little bit cumbersome in that respect. So, my advisor, H.P. Uh, Messenberg, at that time, experimented with that language and derived a dialect, which he called Object Overall, which introduced classes and methods. And over the years, and then eventually together with Niklaus Weird, that uh, dialect was a little bit refined, and we ended up with Oberon 2. And the interesting thing is about Oberon 2 is that it introduced methods in a very similar notation that we now use uh, for Go. So let's have a look at a piece of code in Oberon 2. So here we have a module, which is really a package called trees, and there is a tree data structure, and there's a lookup function. I'm going to not say much here about this, but I'm going to look at the analog code uh, written in Go. So if you squint, I'm going to go back again, if you squint at the Oberon 2 code, just about right, it almost looks the same. Hmm. Go back for one more time. Uh, the difference is quite obvious just uh, in the keywords. So here we have different keywords, they're, they're lowercase. Packet, a module is called package, but otherwise it's the same structure. Uh, we have types, we have, uh, we don't have a struct in Oberon, we have a record, uh, but we have also a function or, you know, in this case, procedure declarations. And look at that receiver type declaration here. It's exactly the same. So, the observation here is that we really have the same the same uh, structure here, except that instead of the Oberon 2 tokens, we have essentially C tokens, but we have Oberon 2 structure. We have the same concepts, packages, imports, types, functions, methods, etc. Uh, in Go, we went a little bit further and we distilled some of the features even more. So for instance, there's only one loop construct in Go, the for statement, while uh, in Oberon 2 there's, there's uh, so, the heritage of, of Go is at least as much Oberon 2 or, you know, the Pascal line as it is C. And in fact, 
all these concepts that I mentioned here, packages, imports, strict memory safety, garbage collection, dynamic hype checks, etc., they're actually coming from overall terminal. <clears throat> but programming language design didn't stop here. Uh, object orientation and genetics was becoming quite popular around 1990. And object orientation in particular was a paradigm that had established itself by now as a very valuable paradigm and concept in an imperative programming language. And so we wanted to make sure that Go can support it well. At the same time, we see also a proliferation of dynamic, dynamically typed interpreted programming languages. <coughs> These languages often trivially support object-oriented programming by the way they are implemented. And also because there is no static type system, it makes it easy to write generic code in those languages, such as a minimum function, for instance, that uh, you know, works as long as you provide the right uh, matching arguments. But maybe 10, 15 years later, we see a backlash. It turns out that complex OO code is really hard to read. And some people have uh, compared it as the modern analog to you know, the spaghetti code of the 1970s. And also, a realization uh, started to... Uh, people started to realize that large programs are dynamically typed Languages are really hard to maintain. If the program becomes more than, say, 10,000 lines of code, it's, it's very difficult to understand what's going on except for the original author. Together with the object orientation and the fancy type systems, type systems languages also introduced a lot more notation. And uh, Rob Pike talked about this in his uh, talk, Public Study One, Moscow, 2010. Still, it was clear that we uh, wanted to get some support for object orientation. And the inspiration in Go came, in this case, from Smalltalk. It's always good to go back to the originators of something. Well, Simulab was a little bit before, but uh, of, a, of a little bit of a different nature. So in Smalltalk, everything is an object. And I can send a message, which is really a method call, to any object. And if the object understands the message, then you know, everything is fine. If the object doesn't understand the message, then I will get an error, uh, basically an error that says, you know, I, I don't understand this message. So in Go, we wanted to have somehow the same power, but without the possibility of getting this runtime error of uh, you know, message not understood. So that means we needed a way uh, in which we could describe which messages were understood by an object. And this led directly to the notion of interfaces, as it's quite obvious in, uh, in hindsight. But furthermore, to really get to the same power as in Smalltalk, we needed to be able to send messages to any object, or in Go terminology, to any instance of any type. Typically, that's not possible in an object or in the language. Typically, you can only send uh, messages or actually call methods on instances of classes. Because in the implementation, you need to have extra information when you do a virtual dispatch. And that extra information is typically a word or so, and that's usually somewhere in, in that uh, data structure, which is usually you know, a class or a struct, C++. So, but we realized that this extra piece of information is actually only needed when you do a dynamic dispatch. You can have methods, and we have them in Go, without dynamic dispatch, and they're completely free. They're essentially just syntactic sugar. So this realization uh, led to the crucial insight that we only need this information when we want to do the dynamic dispatch, which is when we call a method through an interface. And so, the trick is, of course, we store this information in the interface and not with the, with the data. So with this mechanism, it became possible to attach methods to any type without having instances of the type having to carry around extra type information. 
This is really the only additional machinery that was needed to make object orientation possible in Go. There's of course also concurrency support, and I'm not going to go talk about this much. Uh, Rob has elaborated on this much more eloquently than I can. Uh, also, VG yesterday mentioned concurrency, uh, but I, I'm going to mention these two papers here if you want to learn more about the origins. So finally, we have generics, or sometimes called parametric polymorphism. At least the more, which is the more precise term. And it's probably the single biggest feature that's absent in Go. But what exactly is it? It's most often missed by newcomers to Go who haven't really written a lot of Go code yet. Uh, it is true, it would be useful sometimes, but we rarely miss it, in fact. It's also more of a type system mechanism. It's not clear if it's an essential language mechanism. So, with, with all the features that we try to include into Go, we try to make sure these were mechanisms that had established themselves over a long period of time, were found in many programming languages in some form or another, and really carried their weight. Genericity is a very, very complex subject. It's both in semantics and in implementation. There are significant trade-offs. So, to mention a few, should a generic feature leads to duplication of code and thus larger binary? Or should it just be there for ease of expression, but then potentially lead to, uh, lead to a slower binary? Uh, or should it just replicate code in the form of like a macro and then lead to larger source code? So there, there are just a few things to consider. It's also a non-orthogonal feature. It interacts with pretty much any other language feature. So it's not that we haven't thought about it. We even have prototyped it. In fact, Ian Lance Taylor uh, had several proposals and even implemented parts of them. But we are not at a point where we feel like we really understand it well enough. So at the point, we basically are holding off and keep thinking about it. So <clears throat> how did we get together? Uh, how did we get all this together into this nice compact piece? Uh, this nice compact language called Go. So it helped for sure that we had the luxury to sit down for almost two years, pretty much undisturbed, and hammer out the basics. What was crucial when we did this is that we added one feature at a time. We pretty much would come in one morning and say, OK, we're going to discuss maps. And then we would just work on maps for a week, two weeks, maybe longer, until we had something that we felt like would, would work. And, and then proceed, with repeat. Sometimes it would go back and change things. But by doing this uh, uh, design in this way, we made sure that every time we added a feature, we had the mechanism uh, to basically check it against everything else that we already had and make sure it didn't interfere in some ways. Uh, and as a result, we achieved a mostly orthogonal design. However, this was a very hard process. Uh, initially, we were just a team of three people, albeit very, very different people. And so the discussions were pretty intense, uh, sometimes emotional. It was a very humbling experience. But it was really useful to have all three people in this room because everybody brought a different perspective on things. And I think, and Rob Pike mentioned that too, I think we all agree that the result is much better than if any one of us had come up with something. Uh, a little bit later, Ross Cox joined the team and he really cut through the crowd, pretty much. He asked the right questions, and he clarified a lot of things. And he didn't just make it work, he really made it work well. So, thank you very much for that. Uh, Ian Lance Taylor one day showed up and said, hey, I have a Go compiler. We, we didn't know he was working on this, and he in fact had a, a prototype running, 
Uh, it's called GCC, and now it's you know a real compiler. It's GCC Go, uh, and we were a little bit surprised, but we were really happy to see a second implementation, and in fact, it proved tremendously valuable because now we had two independent implementations. They were not sharing any code. They were basically based on the same spec, or at least we thought on the same spec. It turns out that. Different people read things differently, and so the implementations uh, varied in minor ways, which was extremely illustrative because we would find a lot of bugs in both the compilers and also the spec. And now we even have a third front end, if you will, uh, the Go Types package, which is going to go into the standard repo for 1.5, and it provided even a third validation. And uh, during the writing of code types, we found bugs in the compilers, both of them in code types and in the spec. So this was extremely useful. So we are pretty confident now that we have a, a much, much better spec than what we had you know, a few years back. So the language went through quite a bit of change over time. So the, the original design is quite different from what we have now. And it was very useful to, at the same time, not just work on the language, but also work on the library, because it allowed us to vet our features and not design into the blue. We also had this tool, go Fund and then later go fix, which helped us adjust existing code. So when we decided that we needed to change something, it was very easy to do, because if the syntax changed, we would just run go font, reading the old syntax and producing the new syntax. If we wanted to change library APIs, we would write a go fix package, sorry, module, and, and, and run it over the library. So this allowed us to actually move library and language forward while it was still evolving. This is something that, uh, was extremely powerful and uh, crucial, I think. Because if you don't have this mechanism, you're at some point stuck with what you have. You have too much code that you can't go and change. So here's a list of features that came in much later. Most notably, the optional semicolons. The first, first release, I believe, still had the semicolons. And so there was a large amount of code out there, not just in our code base, but also outside. And having GoFund fix it all up was tremendous. We're still doing a few backward compatible changes from time to time, uh, the occasional bug fix, but this is proceeding now at a very, very low rate. So I'd like to say a few words about how I see the future of Go. It, if I read the signs right, it looks like the future is pretty bright. <coughs> but it's very really difficult to come up you know, with a very educated guess. But we can look at some of the aspects of the programming language to figure out what makes it successful. And so here is a, a somewhat incomplete list of things that help making language successful. It's good to have a clear target. We were really targeting systems programming. And it didn't actually matter that it was the wrong target. The first people that showed up using Go were Python programs. But at least we had a target and we were focused. Uh, the most famous example probably is PL1, a programming language that was designed to solve all programming problems. Didn't go very far. But equally important as the language is the libraries and the tools. It's completely useless if you have a great language but no libraries or no tools. But the market needs also to be ready. If you have the language of the future and nobody understands its features, and the market doesn't need its mechanisms, you're designing into a void. It can help if your language has some technological breakthrough. For instance, Fortran was the first language that implemented uh, decent uh, register optimizations and allocations for expressions. Uh, Algo 60 introduced an estimable program structure, uh, locality of scope, recursion, things like that. Modular 2 and ADA 
they introduced the notion of packages. It's also helpful if you have a language without competitors, feature, uh, with, with features without competitors. For instance, Lisp was the first language uh, that really had recursion. It had a lot of firsts in there. Uh, Basic at the time was much better than any branch oriented system. And Smalltalk was a, had a lot of firsts in numerous aspects. It was interactive, it was graphical, it was object oriented, it was extremely simple. Marketing rarely helps though. Uh, Sun Microsystems bet the farm on Java, and in some way they succeeded. Java survived, but Sun is dead. <laughs> so how about Go? So we clearly had a, a clear target behind the design. Uh, it's a multi-paradigm language and syntactically lightweight, so it appeals to a large group of programmers. It has a few language features without competition, at least for now, coroutines and interfaces, uh, and defer until a few months ago. Uh, Swift now has a defer. There are some tools without competition, again, until recently. Uh, we have a fast compiler. Okay, Pascal, uh, Turbo Pascal had a very fast compiler. Mm -hmm. uh, GoFund, it turns out that now a lot of other programming languages have tried to you know, implement their own standard formatting tool. Uh, GoBuild, a build tool that allows you to build your software without referring to uh, an extra description such as a make file. Go has strong standard libraries, and it has a pretty solid implementation that's only going to get better. And we have pretty good documentation. But really, almost no corporate marketing. Actually, no corporate marketing. So will Go ever become mainstream? Hard to say. Okay? We need to cross the chasm from the early adopters to the early mainstream. And I don't know if you're there yet. It's a little bit like <coughs> trying to figure out if you're at the end of a recession. You know, when the end of the recession is declared, you've already been in recovery for a long time. So, but I think it's really important that the Go community as a whole is unifying behind this goal. Uh, we can't afford too many you know, grave mistakes going forward. And you know, a grave mistake, for instance, would be fragmentation of the platform. But we also need to keep in mind that it usually takes about 10 years for a programming language to get established. That's, that's just the time it takes for a significant amount of people to really start programming in it. Um, and and for, for people to really understand the language. Uh, it turns out that even now, seven years after uh, its inception, we still find new ways to write a particular piece of code. And, uh, you know, I cannot even conceive how, how many you know, hundreds of years it will take for C++. <laughs> 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 so, what are some pitfalls? Uh, the language is really frozen, but in some form, some of these uh, special comments, build tags, special implementation of import paths, <coughs> internal packages, rendering descriptions, are kind of a form of language design. For instance, internal packages is the poor man's mechanism to build your components so that people cannot access the internals. Uh, vendoring descriptions is something where we almost went the wrong way. So we need to be very careful of these things. Uh, they're not specified in the spec, but when you actually write a piece of code, you really need to know and adhere to the specification of these extra notational uh, extra notations in your code. So uh, let me let me close with an observation. And don't don't read too much into this. I, I just sort of happen to walk into this observation. Uh, in the 1960s, language experts from both America and Europe actually teamed up to create Algo 60. And these were all people that actually had experience in language implementation. This is quite a bit different from 
designed by committee nowadays, where there's often a lot of people in the committee that have never implemented a programming language. In the 1970s, the alcohol tree split up in basically two branches, the C branch and the Pascal branch. And of course, both of these branches produced an enormous number of successor languages. Um, but in some ways, it split up in the American and the, and the European branch. And somebody said at some point that, um, you know, a programming language reflects the personalities of the designers, and as such, it probably also reflects the, the countries of the creators. Uh, and I remember an anecdote that uh, somebody told me about Niklaus Weird, uh, where somebody told him that he thought the language Pascal really reflects the state of Switzerland. It's kind of small, clean, compact, but somewhat limited in scope. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's uh, about 40 years later, and in many ways, these two branches actually join again and go. We have both influences from C and we have influences from Pascal. And if you look at the actual people involved, and, and here is where I would say don't read too much into it. You know, we had originally three team members, one from America and one from Europe, and then we had a third one from Canada who was a neutral arbiter. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's see if Go can join equally long run as its predecessors. Thank you very much for listening. So, I think at this point we really uh, think of Go as a general purpose language. And uh, I think that's also, that's also how we, how, the way how people use it. I mean, we find now users from all over the, uh, the, the spectrum. And I think that's, that's how we see it at this point. was created uh, somewhat modeled after other standard libraries, most notably probably Plan 9. A lot of Plan 9, there's a lot of Plan 9 similarities. For instance, the format package is, uh, is you know, inspired by it a little bit, albeit we use a different, we use, we use uh, uh, you know, the, the formatting verbs as in C. Uh, but the name font, for instance, actually comes from from Plan 9, it doesn't come from Model 3 as was hinted at yesterday. Uh, but there is a lot of somewhat random development in the standard library, and uh, it only got cleaned up over time. I don't think we had a particularly uh, clear design goal there. But the others may, again, think differently. No, automatic reference counting was definitely a big item in the beginning. Uh, in fact, uh, we thought this would be the way to go because it would allow uh, to amortize the cost of memory collection. And we were really looking into this. But the problem is you have concurrency, and so when you have um, uh, reference counting, it gets very tricky. And so uh, you can maybe get by with log free algorithms. We, we, in fact, did talk to people who implemented things like that, uh, most notably David Bacon from IBM, uh, who implemented a, uh, a garbage collecting system called Metronome, uh, and, and we actually talked to him. But uh, 
think it's the, the problem is even when you do everything right, at the end of the day you can have cycles. And at some point you have to collect those cycles. And uh, when you have to do that, you end up actually writing the garbage collector anyway. So we decided to not go that route. Most of the users of Go seem to be server-side developers. I seem to be unusual because I'm client-side and a developer. And uh, I seem to use Go as DevOps. Do you see So, so let me correct this. So the original design was not a standard uh, general purpose programming language. The original uh, design was really a systems programming language and actually a server language because that's what we do at, at Google. And so uh, this is clearly what you see also in the, in the library. Uh, uh, there's no graphics, there's no you know, UI library for instance to speak of. Uh, now it's a general purpose programming language and I think we would love to have something like a UI library. But it's a very hard uh, problem to come up with something that's actually cross-platform. And so, you know, that's something where we could use a lot of help from the Go community and from experts. Can probably take two, this one and the next one. Uh, yeah, is there any thought to like make Go uh, more functional or to allow like a large swath of functional programming um, from the beginning? Because it's definitely an imperative language, but some functional, uh, there is functional possibilities. Well, there's a lot of functional possibilities already. You have closures, and you can uh, adhere to a programming, a functional programming style. But at this point, as Rob Pike said, the language is frozen, and we really want to stick to this because uh, we don't want to open the door for the language design. It's really important for for uh, everybody. Thanks so much for all of your team's work and the great language retrospective. My question is something a little different from Golang. How do you feel about little languages or domain-specific languages since Go is very much of a general purpose programming language? So we, we had actually worked on a domain-specific language called Salsa before, which was also in use at Google. And um, there's one observation here. Whenever you have a domain-specific language, Eventually, that language becomes used for things that you didn't anticipate it for, or, or it becomes used for programs that become larger and larger and larger, and you end up pretty much adding all the features that you would have in a general purpose programming language anyway. And so if you don't do this, the, that general, that domain specific language is, is very, very clo close, uh, closed up and cannot be used for all things. But if you do add all these features, then you don't have a domain specific language anymore. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, there, there are areas where it makes sense, but this is not what we wanted to achieve. Thank you very much.